James Owen. Uh, James is a Royal Society Fellow at Imperial College London. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's degrees as well as his PhD from the University of Cambridge. Uh, after that, he was a postdoc at CETA and a Hubble Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study before joining the faculty at Imperial. Uh, and today he will tell us about the formation and evolution of Kepler planets. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, give you a sense of the sort of the important physics that we might be thinking that are involved in explaining the origin of these close-in planets that Kepler has been finding in abundance. So I like to start my talks off with a, a motivation, and I like that motivation often to be a plot. So um, in exoplanets. This is very, very easy. You can just go on the exoplanet archive and, and download a, a plot of the exoplanet population. So this is showing the, the planet radii as a function of orbital period. Um, and you can see uh, uh, several things. So these are the terrestrial planets in our, our solar system on this plot. And you can see that there's this huge population of close-in planets that have radii between sort of one and uh, four Earth radii, and they've been discovered recently. So this is the population of uh, Kepler planets. And these were not expected. These are uh, very mysterious, and I'm going to try and talk through uh, how we might get some indications into how these things might have evolved into the population we see today. So the important thing to emphasize is that the population is billions of years old very distinctly separated in time from the formation phase, which only lasted a few million years. So we want to consider any processes that may have happened between the formation process and the time when we see them today, because if we try and directly just say, this is the population as we see it today, and it's representative of how it formed, then we may often uh, run into traps. So the other thing that's very interesting about this exoplanet population is if you just consider the population of planets inside 100 days and between sort of one and four Earth radii, then when you calculate their occurrence rate, you actually find they're incredibly common. So this is a uh, sort of one of the early analyses uh, of this, this work, and you look at this sort of last few bins here where you're starting to consider these sort of Earth, super Earths, and small Neptunes and large Neptunes, and you just consider the, the planets between sort of Earth radii and, and Neptune radii uh, out to sort of the period of Mercury, which is about 85 days, and you start seeing that these numbers start getting large and getting qualitatively or close to and bigger than 50%. So you might argue that this type of exoplanet population that we're seeing that's very close to the stars inside 100 days, inside the orbit of Mercury in our solar system, and has radii between one and four Earth radii is actually common. So it's a common output of the planet formation process. And it's something we don't understand. So if you want to try and understand how these may have originated, one of the sort of easiest things you can look at is what they're made of. Right? If you know what they're made of, then you can have a guess at how you put that material together to see what we have today. And this is sort of looking at the compositions of these planets. So what Kepler did was Kepler measured the planetary radius. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, yeah. so Kepler measured the planetary radii. Uh, if you combine this with measurements of the mass, then you can get a constraint on the density. The so oh, that works. So you can get a right. Let's make sure this doesn't happen again. You can get a. In fact, I'll go with it. <laughs> you can get a constraint on the density, and then you can compare that density to composition models to have some kind of inf uh, inference as to what they were made of. And there's many ways of showing this, but this is perhaps my favourite version of this plot because it shows several important. So this is the incident flux that the planet receives from the star, scale to Earth units. So the Earth is here. So these are very, very close-in planets, highly irradiated. 
but the radius of the planet using the planet's mass has been scaled to a composition if it were completely rocky. So to have a composition which is sort of rock, iron rich like the Earth. So if you had an Earth-like composition but you buried your mass, you'd sit somewhere along this line here. So this would be your archetypal terrestrial planet. If you want to get any less dense than a terrestrial planet, a rocky terrestrial planet, then you can start adding water and ice. Water and ice are quite abundant in the planet forming regions, but it only gets you so far. You can see that there are many planets that sit well above uh, these rock and uh, water ice curves, and in fact the only way we have a, a good idea as to how to actually explain their radii is to have a solid core, be it made of rock and iron like the Earth, or be it rock and some fraction of ice, but you have to put some hydrogen helium on top of it. So the other intriguing thing about this plot is that you see this significant empty region here. So the, uh, the amount of hydrogen helium in which you're piling on top of these cores seems to be larger at lower insulation fluxes. Right? So, uh, at lower insulation fluxes you can have more hydrogen helium and when you go to very, very, very high insulation fluxes, there are basically no planets which have, or consistent with being, uh, hydrogen and helium rich. So, uh, one question you should have in your mind is given, as I said, this exoplanet population is quite old, billions of years old, distinctly separated from the planet formation phase. Are we actually seeing something here about planet formation? That it's easy to uh, put lots of hydrogen and helium on a planet far away from the star, but it's not so easy to do it in a formation sense close to the star? Or are we seeing something that may have some dependence on distance from the star that's going on during the evolution process? The other uh, thing that's recently occurred in this area is that um, this plot here that I showed you earlier, planet size versus orbital period, uh, these are all the planets of this, as the dots, and you can use the measured error bars to estimate some kind of sort of 2D distribution that looks something like this. So the recent advance has been uh, that the error bars in the radii are quite large. This comes from just uh, looking at the uh, photometry of the Kepler stars. Remember, if you're looking at a planet through the transit measurement, you're not measuring the planet radii directly. You're measuring the radius of the planet radius to the stellar radius. So if you don't know your stellar radius very precisely, you don't know your planetary radius precisely. So what the uh, California Kepler survey did, led by uh, Andrew Howard and B.J. Fulton and Eric Hedegura and a large uh, number of other people, is they got follow-up spectroscopy of a large number of the stars from the uh, Kepler population and were able to more precisely measure the planetary radi uh, stellar radii, sorry, and uh, therefore you measure the planetary radii more precisely. And when you do that, this kind of population goes something uh, like this. So you still see this sort of this clear empty region that I showed you on the earlier plot, where large planets are much less common, close to their stars. But you also see this um, perhaps this second gap here separating a a population uh, down here from a population up here, and you can see this quite cleanly in the uh, binned histogram where you go out to 100 uh, days, you sort of bin, bin this histogram out to 100 days, and look what the radius distribution looks like, and you get, uh, what you might say, two peaks separated by a factor of two in the radius. So I'll come back to this at the end and the kind of clues that I think this is telling us. But the important question that we still want to ask ourselves is, uh, are the trends we see in the exoplanet population telling us something about formation? Right, the planets with lots of hydrogen and helium can only form far away from the star, and uh, sort of terrestrial planets are much more common forming close to the star. Or is there something else that's gone on in those billions of years of evolution between when the planets formed and when we see them today? And in answering those questions, there are various things that we would like to know about the planet population. So what is the composition of these solid cores? Is it something Earth-like? Or is it rock and a large fraction of ice? 
Um, and this tells you, or you can use this to tell you something about where they may have formed in the disk. Right? If you formed it uh, far away from the star in the protoplanetary disk where the disk was cold enough to condense to ice, then a large fraction of the solids is going to be in the ice. Uh, it's going to be icy, so when you agglomerate a solid core, you might expect it to have a large fraction of ice. Alternatively, if you agglomerated the core in the inner regions of the disk where the solids uh, are too hot to contain any ice, then you might expect the core composition to be um, rocky and iron. So, so if you know the core composition, then you can perhaps use this to infer something about the formation location of these planets in the disk and then ask some questions about whether these close-in planets actually formed close to where we see them today or whether they formed at large separations in the disk and then migrated from the disk to their present location. Given there are short periods as well, we have to ask when they arrived on their short period orbits. Did they form where we see them today or close to where they, we see them today in situ formation? Did they migrate through the disk from large separations to small separations or was there some late time dynamical migration that happened after the disk dispersed. This is another type of question you might like to ask. Uh, given some of these planets have solid cores surrounded by hydrogen and helium, you might ask, like to ask uh, what the kind of core mass to hydrogen and helium envelope mass is. More solids, your sort of naive assumption would be more solid mass, more hydrogen and helium mass. And the final question you might like to ask yourself is we know from the solar system, but it, the terrestrial planets in our solar system did not form with large hydrogen helium envelopes surrounding them. You know, the Earth did not have a very massive hydrogen helium envelope when it formed. So, what is the fraction of the planets that formed in a, what I'm going to say is a more traditional terrestrial like planet formation pathway, and what fraction of those planets formed with large amounts of hydrogen helium? You might separate this in terms of what fraction of the planets formed in the gas disk, where they were able to accrete a hydrogen helium atmosphere, and what fraction of planets formed after the gas disk dispersed and were unable to accrete a hydrogen helium atmosphere. And I think the most important process that we need to consider in understanding these planets is what happens to the long-term evolution of these hydrogen helium atmospheres. So this is discussing the process of atmospheric loss. So atmospheric loss is quite a common process in the solar system. Uh, many of the compositions of the planetary bodies, uh, including the terrestrial planets, including the moons uh, around Jupiter and Saturn, have been sculpted by this atmospheric loss process. And what I'm going to emphasize is that atmospheric loss processes which we're familiar with in the solar system are, are quite different to the atmospheric loss processes we might expect to occur in the exoplanet system. So as sort of a, a little uh, example, one of the common mechanisms of atmospheric loss going on in the solar system uh, bodies today is genes escape. So in genes escape what's happening is you have a an atmosphere, and as you go up and up and up in height, that atmosphere gets more and more rarefied. And you eventually reach a uh, <coughs> point in the atmosphere where the atmosphere is so rarefied that over the scale height, one scale height of the atmosphere, the uh, probability that a single gas molecule will collide with another one is very, very small. Right, so you can imagine if the velocity distribution of those gas particles right in the upper rarefied regions of the atmosphere where the collision frequency between gas molecules is very rare and they have some Maxwell-Boltzmann-like velocity distribution, then there'll be some tail of that distribution where the gas particles have significant kinetic uh, energy that if they start going out, they have an insufficient kinetic energy to escape the planet's potential and then are gone forever. So this genes escape process obviously <coughs> on temperature, as you get hotter and hotter and hotter, you populate a larger and larger fraction of this, this tail. But what happens in the exoplanet case is the exoplanets are actually so hot that the peak temperature here is actually well past the energy to escape. The temperature that the atmospheres are able to obtain uh, 
are above the average kinetic energy to escape. They're above the escape. <coughs> so instead of occurring through this sort of particle-like loss where you lose the particles that have sufficient kinetic energy to escape, you can actually get very vigorous hydrodynamic escape. So the UV and X-rays are able to heat up the upper atmospheres of these close-in exoplanets to temperatures <coughs> can be up to 10 to the 4 Kelvin, a lot like a sort of classical H2 region. Um, this is comparable to the escape temperatures of these planets. So instead of getting this slow, uh, slow loss, you actually get a very vigorous hydrodynamic wind. So if I, I take a, a planet that is close to its star and I switch on some UV and X-ray photons, and I get a very powerful heated hydrodynamic wind. So this is something like a, a temperature profile you might get in these atmospheres getting close to 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and this gives you a very uh, high velocity transition from being subsonic to, to supersonic. And this dramatically increases the mass loss rates that you expect compared to the, the genes escape mechanism that is more common in our solar system terrestrial planets. So this opens up the possibility that uh, atmospheric loss can affect the bulk population and sculpt the planet population in, in detail. So it's not just a a theoretical construct in exoplanets them, themselves. It's actually been observed directly, this process occurring. So instead of doing a uh, transit measurement in a broadband uh, filter, like Kepler does in the broadband optical, broadband infrared, like Spitzer does, what you can do is you can do a transit style observation in a specific line. And if you do it in a specific line that has a very, very high cross section to absorption with hydrogen, then you can uh, maybe be able to probe the uh, sort of the outflow that's coming from these planets in this neutral, in this hydrogen. So this is uh, various uh, Lyman alpha spectra. So Lyman alpha has an incredibly high cross section to neutral hydrogen. And what I'm showing here is the uh, sort of dotted line and the black line. Uh, the Lyman alpha spectrum you see from the star when the planet is behind the star. So the planet is not transiting in front of the star. You can't see into the core of the line, unfortunately, because this is obscured by interstellar dust, so you can only look into the, the wings of this line. And uh, so the black line is the outer transit. Uh, the blue line is when the planet is just about to transit. And the green and red lines is when the planet is transiting in front of the star. So you can see that there's almost a 50% reduction in the flux in the blue shifting wing. So if you interpret this as in a transit measurement, what you're doing is you're obscuring a certain fraction of the stellar disk. So a normal optical transit of this planet has something like a 1% dip, obscure, something like 1% of the stellar rate. In this Lyman alpha line, it's obscuring 50% of the stellar radius. You know the mass of this planet, and you know the mass of the star. So you can compute the radius of the uh, Roche lobe, so the radius in which you're formally bound to the planet. And you find that this 50% obscuration area is well outside the Roche radius of this planet. So the gas the neutral hydrogen is temporally associated with the planet itself because it's, uh, you only see this obscuration when the planet is transiting in front of the star. But the hydrogen cloud that's leaving this, or associated with this planet, extends well outside the Roche radius of the planet. So it's not bound to the planet. So because it's temporally associated with the planet, it must have come from the planet. But it's no longer bound to the planet, so it must have been so you can sort of interpret this like this, that you have this very large cloud of hydrogen helium that's leaving the planet's atmosphere. So this has been observed in a few systems now. It's quite a difficult observation because you actually need a uh, star which is close enough and therefore bright enough to actually do this experiment. Um, but hopefully when TESS finds a lot more planets bright stars, 
type of measurement that can be become more common. So we can sort of in, we know this process is happening, and we can ask sort of theoretically what is the expectation. So you have these high energy photons; they're heating uh, the stellar, uh, the planetary atmosphere, and driving these very powerful hydrodynamic outflows that lead to uh, significant mass loss. So this is a, a nice 3D simulation of this process happening. And if you ask the question of how the mass loss va rate varies as a function of planetary pa parameters, uh, where is this effect going to become important for the evolution of the planet? So what I'm showing here is the planet mass versus the planet radius. The color map is showing the expected mass loss rates from theoretical calculations. Uh, the grayed out region is any planet that is bigger than its Roche radius, so it's not bound, not a planet. Right? Um, the white region is uh, this transition between this hydrodynamic re regime and this genes escape regime. So where do the equations of hydrodynamics actually break down? So, um, and then the points are a collection of measured uh, or observed planets in terms of their mass and radius. And the most interesting lines are these dotted lines here. So these are the mass loss rates times a fixed amount of time. So this is the instantaneous mass loss you might expect uh, over that time scale. So this is uh, 10 million years and 100 million. So I'll come to why those timescales are important in a little bit. And you can see that uh, quite nicely there are no planets to the right of this line. That would imply something has gone worryingly wrong. These planets shouldn't exist. But you see that the low mass planets, these planets here, are actually piling up quite close to this line. So even though we have the giant planets up here, which may or may not be losing mass in this hydrodynamic fashion, they're quite far away from these instantaneous so it's not important in an evolutionary sense. But for these low mass planets, it is going to be quite important in an evolutionary sense. And why is it, I said, uh, 100 million years, why is it not the billions of years of evolution that matter? And that's because these outflows are driven by the high energy output of the star. And this is also time dependent. So this is observations of the X-ray luminosity as a function of the fraction of the volumetric luminosity as a function of uh, of age. And these are sort of empirical fits to observed data. And the empirical fits are sort of you have this flat, saturated regime and then it falls off rapidly. <clears throat> now, the important thing here is that these power laws here fall, over, fall off faster than one over time. Right? So if you integrate this curve up, because these power laws are falling faster than one over time, most of the total integrated energy that you absorb occurs in this first few, few hundred million years here, and the amount you absorb here is considerably smaller than this amount here. So it is the first hundred million years that you should care about. So in order to describe the evolution of a planet over its lifetime, we have now a description of how the high energy luminosity varies as a function of time. We have a description for how the mass loss rates vary from models as a function of planet mass and planet radius. Now we need a, a model for how the planet evolves, or what the planet is made of. Right? So we're going to uh, build a simple model and follow what happens in this. Scenario. So I'm going to take a solid core, and it can have a core mass and a core composition, and uh, it can vary from uh, one ridiculous state to the other, 100% iron to 100% ice. And then on top of that, I'm going to put a hydrogen helium that hydrogen helium atmosphere has some initial mass, and it has some initial entropy. Right? So planets are not stars. They have no internal heat generation, or they have a very small amount of internal heat generation for radioactive decay. So they passively cool over time. So the amount of entropy they start off with is an important parameter in their evolution. Because the amount of entropy they start off with sets how big they are, and it sets how much of this high energy flux they absorb at the earliest time. And this is when, obviously, this matters. And we can do these integrations in MESA with some modifications of the stellar evolution code, like putting in a solid core. So 
if you look a bit deeper and understand how these planets might have evolved, other than just saying these planets are close to these lines where evaporation may matter and follow the evolution, so this is radius mass evolution, um, density and uh, sort of instantaneous total mass loss rate, you see that these close in low mass planets, so this is an initially 20 Earth mass planet, loses almost 50% of its total mass over its billion year lifetime. But this is the point at which, instead of the uh, X-ray luminosity being a fixed fraction of the volumetric luminosity, this is the point where that rapid power starts. Right? So you can see quite nicely, as we kind of expected, that the mass loss is confined almost entirely to the first 100 million years of the planet's lifetime. You can see that in the uh, lost mass. Yeah, and the other point to remember, Remember is given we have no constraint on how much entropy these planets had when they started, then you have to uh, pick some guesses. So this is a very high entropy 20 Earth mass planet, and this is a very low entropy 20 Earth mass planet. And you can see that uh, the initial amount of entropy they have matters for their evolution. So uh, in principle, uh, although I'm not going to talk about it in detail, if you have an accurate enough description of how a planet may evolve, then there is uh, some framework in which you may be able to get some constraints on how much entropy they had when they formed. Um, so a classic example of uh, this is this what was a very puzzling system when it was first discovered. This is the Kepler-36 system. It has two planets. They're in a close to a 7 to 6 or in a 7 to 6 resonance. They have barely any difference in orbital separation from the star yet they have completely different compositions. The inner planet is consistent with being completely rocky, solid, having no hydrogen helium atmosphere, while the outer one has to have a hydrogen helium atmosphere, something like 10% of its total mass. But the key difference here is uh, that they have quite different total masses. So the amount of mass in these solid regions is very different. And it's the solid part that completely dominates the gravity of these planets. The additional gravity from adding 10% hydrogen helium is not a very big correction in the total depth of the potential of the planet. So this planet, in principle, because it had a higher central mass, should have been able to hold on to its hydrogen helium better than the lower mass. So what we can do is we can ask the question, so what are the histories of these two planets that were consistent with their observed properties today. So how much hydrogen helium did they have when they start? What was their initial entropy? And so on. So these are the kind of uh, evolutionary curves that you can get that are consistent with their observed properties today. And then you can put them on a plot like this. This is hydrogen helium mass fraction as a function of solid core mass. This is where the observed population sits today. And this is where these two planets sit today. So the inference might be that uh, Planet formation process puts planets up here, and this mass loss process sculpts the planets down into the observed population. So, um, this is something that can be done now for a large number of planets, the approximately 100 planets that we have measured masses and radio for. Um, but it's quite a computationally intensive process, and we've only done two so far. So, uh, this is a, something for the future. Um, but what is actually quite powerful as well is not taking planets with just measured masses and radii, but taking the entire uh, population of just measured radii and seeing what we can say. So if you take a population of planets at birth and you make the assumption that they still have this simple structure, which is a solid core surrounded by a hydrogen heat atmosphere, and you basically uniformly distribute these planets in orbital separation and ask what the population looks like after billions of years of evolution after this photoevaporation process <coughs> has taken hold, and it looks something like this process. This, so this is a, a plot of planet radius as a function of separation. <coughs> different colors here are representative of different solid core masses. Right? So this has the biggest core mass, and this has the lowest core mass. So these planets are able to, uh, these blue planets are able to hold on to a large hydrogen helium atmosphere closer to the sky. So you see this obvious thing that you might have expected, that uh, 
as you get closer and closer to the star, <coughs> with the increased insulation, it's harder and harder to hold on to a large hydrogen atmosphere. Right? So you get this nice empty region that I kind of indicated at the start. The other interesting thing is that you see this uh, gap here, this gap between planets that are able to hold on to about 1% of their mass in hydrogen helium and planets that are completely stripped. They've completely lost their atmospheres. So um, this is very nice. I showed you a plot right at the start that looked very similar to this. The other important point here is why understanding the evolution of these planets is quite important is that even though we're only measuring radius of the planets, right, the different colors here represent different core masses. So by understanding this mass loss process, the model tells you you can only exist in certain regions of this parameter space if you have a certain mass. So if you have a measured radius period distribution and you have some model, then you can say something about the planet's mass. And I'll come back to that. So the question you should immediately ask yourself is, that gap looked a bit weird. Um, why do you actually get a gap? What is the physics behind uh, you getting this occurrence value or this photovoltaic? the physics of the, the photoevaporation value. It's quite easy to understand, actually, in a very basic level. So if we go back to our simple picture of our planet, we have a solid core which has some radius, and then we have some hydrogen helium atmosphere which adds to the radius of the planet. And the way you can understand this evolution is by understanding how the mass loss time scale varies as you add mass. Let's make a plot of mass loss time scale as a function of atmosphere mass or envelope mass rate. Right. Now, the thing that's setting the mass loss rate to zeroth order is just how much UV and X ray flux you absorb. Right? And that's set by the radius of the planet and the separation. Let's consider planets at fixed separation. So the radius of the planet essentially sets how much high energy luminosity you absorb. So if you start off with a solid core, which has some fixed radius, and then you add a tiny amount of hydrogen helium, it doesn't change the radius of the planet very much. So it doesn't change the amount of high energy flux you absorb, so to zero order it doesn't really change your mass loss rates. If you add a tiny bit more hydrogen helium, the mass of the <coughs> atmosphere, the mass of the envelope, increases. But again, because the mass of the core and the radius of the core completely dominates over the mass and radius of the atmosphere. Again, I haven't changed the radius of the planet very much. So I haven't changed how much high energy flux the planet can absorb. So I haven't changed the mass loss rates. So the mass loss rate has stayed roughly the same, but the mass of the atmosphere has increased. So the mass loss time scale must increase when I start off with very, very low atmosphere masses. And this is going to continue, right? till I reach the point where the radius of the atmosphere is now the thing that dominates the radius of the total planet. So when the radius of the atmosphere dominates the radius of the planet, the radius of the core is irrelevant. And what's setting the uh, amount of high energy flux I can absorb is how that radius responds to adding mass. So it turns out when you do this, and this is set by the microphysics of the problem, so how the opacity varies with pressure and what the equation of state of hydrogen helium is. Um, but once the radius of the planet is dominated by hydrogen helium and you add a little bit of hydrogen helium, the radius expands enormously. So if the radius expands enormously, the amount of high energy flux that I can absorb increases enormously. My mass loss rate increases enormously. So this means that once you get to the point where the atmosphere of the planet starts to dominate the, uh, atmos uh, the radius of the planet, is dominated by the atmosphere, then this mass loss time scale comes back down. So you end up with a very simple curve that looks like something like this. And it obviously peaks where you transition from being dominated by the radius of the core to being dominated by the radius of the atmosphere. So this peak occurs with the atmosphere or the envelope that doubles the core's radius. So now we're in a position to understand where this uh, gap comes from. So we have these uh, curves here of envelope or atmosphere mass fraction. It always peaks around a percent. The percent value is not the magic value. The magic thing to remember is that you peak where the atmosphere doubles the radius of the core. 
equations. This is the, that's the bit of physics, not the 1%. The 1% comes from how the equation of state of hydrogen varies and what the opacity structure is. So you have these curves of mass loss times scale as a function of envelope or atmosphere mass. And you have some time to do the evaporation. You have this 100 million years in which you're able to evaporate these planets. So if you have a mass loss time scale less than 100 million years, then you're going to be unstable to mass loss and you're going to evolve to lower atmosphere or envelope masses. If you have a mass loss time scale that's much longer than 100 million years, then your atmosphere mass is not going to change over that 100 million year time scale. So you're going to be relatively stable. And you can move these curves up and down in the vertical direction, obviously, by changing the mass of the core. If you have a more massive core, you shift everything up because it's harder to lose mass. Or if you move yourself closer to the star, then you move everything down because you have more total flux to absorb, so you become more unstable to So anything that starts off on this side of the curve right, is going to be unstable to mass loss. It's going to start losing mass. But eventually, it's going to reach an envelope mass where the mass loss time scale now becomes longer than 100 million years, and you become stable again, and you fix at this envelope mass. Whereas if you start off over here, and you start losing mass, your mass loss time scale just gets continually smaller, and you undergo a run. So if you consider a population which has initial envelope mass fractions like this, and you step through these different core masses, and you step through these different separations, Planets either evolve towards this peak where they're maximally stable, or planets evolve to where they're completely stripped, and you end up with a sort of double peaked distribution. So if you look at that in a video sense, that you take a radius versus period diagram, you start all the planets off with some hydrogen and helium, and then you let them evolve. As you start getting close, to, close towards this 100 million time, year time scale, evaporation starts to be important. Lots of planets cross this gap, right? piling up here, or piling up here, and you end up with something that after a few million years looks very, very similar to so, which is quite nice. Uh, you can see this uh, nicely in these videos that Eric Paragura made me when I sent him a previous video. It was like, that's not good enough. Please send me the data. Uh, so this is a planet that's uh, evolving. Here's the hydrogen helium envelope. Here's the core. Let it go. Then it gets stuck, but it's got enough time to actually cross become a solid core. Right, but if you put that same planet a bit further away, it doesn't have enough flux to complete the mass loss, and it gets stalled at this point where it has an envelope that basically doubles the core of these. So uh, because you're getting stuck at where you double the core radius, it shouldn't be surprising that when we look at the observations, you should have two peaks separated by a factor of two in radius. So this is very, very nice. <coughs> Now, let's say you believe every, the entire story I've just told you. Can we go any further? And we can, because, as I told you, we have a measured radius distribution, and the model says you can only exist in certain regions of the parameter space if you have a certain mass. So the position of this valley in radius and period of space is actually strongly sensitive to the core composition. So you can make a plot of where this radius uh, versus separation, or high energy flux, total amount of high energy <coughs> flux you absorb, should sit in this plane depending on what the core composition is. Right, so if you have very dense cores, then you can only strip the most massive cores very close to the star because they have a very high escape uh, velocity, whereas if you go to icy cores, it's easier to strip those more massive cores further away because they're just bigger, right? So the depth of the potential is small. Right, so given uh, this theoretical prediction, given the observations, you can actually say, well, let's compare the two and see what we get. So in doing that, the first thing you must notice, right, is that this spread in composition, uh, uh, in the sort of spreads of where these valleys should appear, is quite large. Right, so if there was a large spread in the core compositions, then you'd see nothing. You'd see no gap at all. The fact we see something tells you the spread in core composition. I think this is an irrefutable uh, conclusion if you believe it. Uh, it doesn't matter what the mass loss rates are. If you have some model of the mass loss rates, and we think we do, then comparing the radius distribution to these different distributions and these different core compositions says that the cores cannot contain any water or ice, and in fact, probably iron and silicon. 
So in terms of uh, answering these questions, so insights from the Kepler planets, the solid core composition, we're going to say it's rocky. That's what the model is seeming to suggest, which implies maybe formation inside the snow line. In terms of arrival at short period orbits, right, because this process is, has to happen in the first 100 million years, if you put the planets to where you see them today after a billion years, or two billion years, this process doesn't happen. A high energy flux is too low. So in terms of arrival at short period orbits, either they formed where you see them, or perhaps they migrated through the disk, and any late time dynamical migration that happened after 100 million years can be ruled out. And a fraction of planets born with and without hydrogen helium, well, we seem to be able to create almost a lot, almost all the planets we see with no hydrogen helium today just by this mass model process. So you would say that the, all these planets, almost all of them, formed inside the gas disk within the first 100 million years. Right, so these conclusions are quite important. They're very nice. They say something about how the planets formed, right, but then very model dependent depend on you believing the story that I've just laid out over the last half. So we should test it. The first test is that the, this radius gap should have a period dependence, right? We can only strip the most massive cores close to the star, so the radius peak, the radius at which they, they uh, reach should be closer, larger, closer to the star, and decline with distance from the star. So, um, the California Kepler survey data was not good enough to measure this, so we uh, what the astro seismologists did is they have an even more precise sample of stellar radii where they measure the planetary and stellar radii to sort of a few percent precision, and then you see that this gap is incredibly clean, stands out obviously. Then you can measure the decline or measure the slope, and the slope is clearly negative, which is consistent with the model, and it matches the, again, assuming a model, it matches a suggestion that the cores are ice, uh, uh, ice poor, rock iron rich, and you have some, uh, uh, some variable efficiency in how you turn energy into uh, mass loss. So, uh, the, the slope depends on the physics of the evaporation that you're able to lose some energy through. So that's quite nice. I think the model has passed that test. The second test is that this plot here also has some spectral type dependence, right? So the earlier type stars have a lower uh, relative X-ray and UV luminosity uh, that lasts a shorter amount of time compared to the later type stars. So if you look at the planet population in terms of fixed bolometric flux, you should see that this process is far more important around later type stars than earlier type stars. So, uh, I'm not going to give you the answer to that because we don't have the data. Uh, the CKS team, there's now a CKS cool proposal where we're filling in this population here. But the prediction is that as you go to lower and lower uh, star masses, everything should shift to the right where this evaporation process is becoming more and more important. So in my uh, last uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, slightly uh, break down some of the conclusions I've shown upon you and sort of throw some caution to the wind, as it's always good to do. So um, there's a big problem, right, that I said that we can explain all the planets that we see as if they formed uh, with a hydrogen helium atmosphere that we then lost. However, I am standing on a planet that I know that did not happen. So there must be some uh, perhaps secondary population of uh, what I'm going to call born terrestrial were born without a hydrogen helium atmosphere. This is something that depends very strongly on how well we know our evaporation model. So this is a very simple model. You get no planets out here in this kind of model. A more advanced model gives you some population out here. So I think this is an important thing that we need to look at. And it also makes an important discussion in terms of what might we expect the atmospheres of terrestrial planets to look like when we're able to observe them. So this is something that's plausibly possible in, with Ariel in sort of 10 years' time. But if you have a born terrestrial planet, its atmosphere is gonna come primarily from outgassing of the material and any delivery from comets. However, <coughs> this other scenario where we have a stripped 
hydrogen helium atmosphere, we're going to be outgassing into that hydrogen helium atmosphere. Uh, something I learned in the last six months is that the composition that you outgas actually depends very strongly on what the pressure that you're outgassing into. And then, obviously, if you're outgassing into <coughs> high pressure hydrogen helium atmosphere being stripped away, <coughs> then you might expect a, a, a somewhat different composition. And this is a suggestion that we might want to think about in terms of theoretical model. Um, that's plausibly observable. Um, people don't like this result, right, that, uh, that we're seeming to suggest that planets don't form outside the ice line. The population synthesis do not like ice-free wolf formation models, right? Every time they try and run a model, they get tons of ice-rich planets in the inner disk. So as a, a good theorist, I'm going to try and uh, uh, give them some, a bit of freedom to work with. But I'm going to put some strong constraints on what you expect to happen. So again, this is radius versus separation, but the actual variable that's mattering in physics is the high energy <coughs> flux. Right. And you have to have a model that connects this high energy flux that you absorb to the separation. Right. This is some mass loss rate model. So if you change your mass loss rate model, then you shift these curves about, and then you would shift the interpretation of what the core composition is. So one way to uh, shift, uh, change the model, and change how much mass loss you use for a given lose, for a given input of energy, is to put some magnetic fields. If you put strong magnetic fields on the planet, then you get closed dipolar field lines close to the equator, and this is basically able to hold on to the atmosphere. And you get no outflow in this equatorial region, and only outflow along the poles, so you're losing mass over a much smaller fraction of the planet's area, so the mass loss rate goes down, but the radius of the gap is fixed right, by the observations. So if you want to strip a planet of fixed radius with a lower mass loss rate, you better make it lower mass. If you make it lower mass, then you make it more ice rich. So there is a degeneracy between the strength of the planetary magnetic field and the composition which you infer of the cores from the, the planet. So if you have quite a weak field, then it makes no difference. If you go to quite strong fields, then you are getting up to very ice rich cores. I want to emphasize this is not the magnetic field at the surface of the core, it's the magnetic field where the peak in that mass loss rate function is. So it's the uh, magnetic field when you have a heavy <coughs> helium envelope that doubles the core rate. So if you want this magnetic field to come entirely from the core, right, you have to times it by a factor of eight. Um, so, uh, how might we tell? Um, one obvious way is, right, you just go measure the masses of these planets right below the gap and see what they're made of. That's a somewhat obvious way of telling what their composition is. Uh, another way is to actually observe the outflow itself and see how much and how the planet is losing mass. So this is my final few slides of the uh, history. So, Antonia has showed that there is a very nice probe of these outflows in this helium metastable line. And it's very nice for two for reasons. It's completely dominated, very close to the planet, which unlike the Lyman Alpha that I showed you earlier, the Lyman Alpha is dominated very, very far away from the planet. So there's lots of complicated things, like interactions with stellar magnetic fields, stellar wind that become important. If you're close to the planet, then you're just dominated by the physics of the mass model. And this has actually been observed by Jess Spake. The other very exciting thing about this line is you can do it from the ground. It's a near infrared line. You can do it from the ground. You can do it at high resolution. If you can do it at high resolution, then you can probe the kinematic properties of the line. So here is my hypothesis. If you have a star it's transiting its planet and it's driving an evaporative flow, you're going to primarily, primarily heat the day side, right? So you're going to drive this very powerful flow off the day side. You're not heating the night side, so you have a very strong day-night pressure gradient. This causes the uh, outflow to turn around and uh, flow behind the planet. So if you're observing any uh, line emission that's coming uh, from one or two planetary radii in transit, you're going to be probing this kind of region. So you might expect that the line, in this case, with no magnetic fields, is blue shift. If I put on a magnetic field, 
uh, this, this is a dipolar magnetic field. You have to follow the dipolar field lines. The dipolar field lines are vertical here. Uh, so it's basically orthogonal to this process. So um, you would expect to see no blue shift, and you might even see a small red shift just from the output leaving away from the planet. So this is another way that we might be able to determine uh, whether these planets have strong so there's a lot of interesting work to be done to actually pin down and test this model because if it's true, I think the conclusions on uh, how the planet is formed is quite profound. We've learned a lot. And we have some clues as to how we might improve our planet formation models. So in summary, close-in planets are small uh, and they're common. And they many contain hydrogen helium atmospheres. And many more contain hydrogen helium atmospheres when they were born, and they lost them due to EUV and X-ray heating that can drive this photoevaporative mass measurement. Photoevaporation drives this sort of bimodal evolution where either you strip a planet completely or you leave behind approximately 1% by mass hydrogen helium. Remember, the 1% is not a magic number. It's the fact you're doubling the planet's radius. That's the physical matter. And the photoevaporation-driven evolution model provides powerful constraints in the closer planet formation models, um, but you need to trust them. You need to trust them all. You need to test them. Uh, right. So, thank you very much. Please ask questions. So, does the fact that we see a body tell you, like, or some of a limit to how much second order of gas happens? Like, because if they all have gas, like a lot. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's putting some constraint that the amount that you have gas uh, can't change the radius of the planet very much. Um, in terms of mass, the composition you have gas is not normally hydrogen helium dominated. It's normally heavy element dominated. So it has a much smaller scale height, right? So you can fit quite a lot more mass in a at secondary atmosphere than you can with hydrogen helium. Um, so for example, just for, for knowledge that the Earth's atmosphere by mass is something like uh, one part in 10 to the minus six of the core mass. Right? So, uh, and that affects no difference. But you could probably go up to like one part in 10 to the minus three. It would make no difference to the radius. Um, during the first 100 million years, there's a lot of collisions. Yeah. What do you think that would do for you, especially giant? Uh, so giant impacts are going to do uh, two things, right? They're going to move the orbital locations of the planet around. Um, and the second thing is that they're going to give you additional masses. So it should smear out the cleanliness of uh, what we see. The fact we see it right, is telling me perhaps that the resulting impacts from giant impacts either don't change the orbital locations of where we see the planets dramatically in the first 100 million years, or they don't change the amount of mass, hydrogen helium mass, uh, they lose. But I know this is, this is difficult to reconcile with our understanding. So that is not a very satisfactory answer, uh, but we've talked about it. It's a problem, right, on either side. Either it's a, it's a problem with the planet formation process or it's a problem with the mass loss. I have a question. So uh, in terms of these magnetic fields, uh, just from magnetic dynamo theory, do we expect that planets with different composition should have a different magnetic field strengths and how will that? Yeah, so, so from, there are dynamo models. Uh, there are dynamo models for the solid core, and there are dynamo models for the hydrogen helium atmosphere. Um, the dynamo models in that scenario seem to suggest that the magnetic field would be relevant. This is the magnetic field generated by convection in the hydrogen helium atmosphere, and the dynamo generated in the solid core uh, is too weak to be important when you double the uh, but I've taken two dynamo models, uh, and given the, uh, as you said, it should be with mass at the core and composition, 
and you should be able to predict what value of the slope you should get, and it doesn't work. So you get completely the wrong slope from these dynamic theory models to be consistent with the data, which maybe says something about how good those dynamic models are, or how good my understanding. Planet to rotate for your dynamo model because I thought we had this expectation that these closing planets should be tidally locked. Right? Yeah, so if they're tidally locked, they're still rotating. They're just okay. rotating, well, it's, it's but they're rotating much slower than the standard models in our solar system. Um, so these uh, dynamo models also have a rotation component. In it. So there's two things that matter: is the rotation and the heat flux. In these they don't have to be synchronized. They so don't have those. Oh, true. Eight You're years. correct. Yes, they don't have to be simple. Mm. I, in fact, I don't have a good number. You probably do, which is better. Which is what is roughly the synchronous time? Depends on theory. Uh, for a ten-day orbital sub-Neptune, probably ten to seven to ten days. So comparable with this kind of thing. So basically, you agree that uh, you can infer the binding energy of the atmosphere by collision and uh, that is also another mechanism. But then if that doesn't, if that little bit smears out the, the distribution, maybe that you can constrain the mass function of the colliding bodies so that the, through the collision uh, they are numerous but not impactful. Yes. Yeah. So I think things that need to be do, done in the modeling, uh, 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 when we fit in terms of the fitting of the population we've done, we've done it by eye, is what Yang Chin Wu and I did last year. Yang Chin's done something, something slightly more sophisticated, but just for the uh, sort of operation model. I think the next stage is to fit it properly, but also account, give the model the freedom to put in these extra things, like the collisions and this secondary population of born terrestrial planets, and see what kind of constraints we can put in a statistical sense on the population. What is the fraction of giant impacts that we can allow under certain conditions? What is the fraction of these born terrestrial planets that we can allow given the data? So, but that will be a model dependent on the It will depend on the efficiency of the application. I think the best constraint on this stuff is going to come up long periods where the importance of photo evaporation becomes weaker. So once you get outside 100 days, then the effect of photo evaporation on the bulk evolution of the planet is quite weak. Unfortunately, 100 days is where the Kepler uh, uh, completeness starts to fall off very, very rapidly. So, uh, we may be lucky, we may be unlucky. If we're unlucky, then we're going to have to wait till Plato, unfortunately. OK, so James is here for the rest of the day, and there are a few more open slots in the afternoon in case people want to chat with him. Uh, he will also give a talk at the IPC Wimbledon in half an hour. So let's thank